So let me uh, orient you about why we're here, or why, why we're teaching this part of uh, polymer science, with the emphasis on the, the physics side. Um, I cannot uh, uh, say enough to indicate that uh, you are polymer scientists, so you should know that, roughly speaking, um, how, how much polymers we quote unquote consume, we don't eat, but we consume them. Uh, and they're still uh, uh, growing uh, with time. And uh, we are nearly around 300 million tons. And for those of you, uh, metric tons, million tons. Uh, for those of you who like uh, pounds, it's several hundred billion pounds. The volume uh, is rumored to exceed that of steel, not by weight, because uh, so the key point about using polymer is the specific strength is very high. In other words, the strength per, it's a strange concept. The strength per weight is high. Uh, so uh, this is a, a strange concept until you think the following way. For example, the steel can be a wire this thin, okay? If I use a polymer that's a little, in fact, polymer is not weaker if you make a successful fiber out of it. Uh, uh, but let's see, in case you don't even make a fiber, then I can make my sample a little thicker, then it will be equally strong as your steel, and still be lighter than the steel. So that's what it means by specific strength. Okay? In this example of fiber, it's quite clear how you can achieve that. But when we make successfully make fibers, we can make them very strong, as strong as steel, even when it's as thin as steel. Or as light, which means, folks, number one you learned from the class is the density of polymer is as that of water. Okay, so it's always one gram per cc, whereas the steel is 7.8. So you are gaining a factor of eight, right? Okay, so uh, our polymers are there because of their uh, sufficiently good specific strength. In other words, the several hundred million tons of polymers is largely used because of, because of their adequate mechanical properties. Everything you have, it's just strong enough to hold the load you have. Okay, so, so it comes about the mechanics. And if you like to think, uh, the whole subject of polymer physics is this piece of pie, then you can really make some divisions out of them. And I would claim at least half of our interest of the polymer science, of the polymer physics, should be all about mechanics. As I said, the several hundred billion pounds mostly is used because they has adequate mechanical strength. In absence of which, we will not be using a hundred billion pounds of them. Period. And there, I mean, I'm generous when I say half. And there are other parts, niches, where you may think about mechanical, optical, Maybe some electrical, there are. The, the circuitry, the fuses in some cases, is it done in such a way when it's hot, this plastic breaks apart, your circuitry is saved because of that. 
as a breaker, as a, a, a fuse. And uh, the rest you heard uh, in your apartment phase one. Um, obviously, uh, when I say obviously, it's kind of interesting. This several hundred billion pounds of polymer, you will be surprised a majority of them are used in their pure form. A great deal is used just in their pure form. Polyethylene, polyethylene, probably, you know, I will make, make a list of it. But, of course, there are a few that you can achieve synergetic effects by blending them. So you probably learned, I hope you learned enough about blending them. You know, glory hugging kind of understanding of how the mixing is typically difficult. Okay, because the entropy gain is very little. And then, uh, you know, you may talk about a uh, film, things like that. You can go on a little bit. Uh, and that, that is supposedly the part that I'm not covering. The part I'm covering is the mechanical aspect. So let me give you a little more incentive for thinking about mechanics. The ultimate goal after 10 weeks, and certainly after this course, was, to, was for you to have an appreciation of what is that mechanics, how we can understand it, from the viewpoint of a chemist that you may be able to design accordingly, according to what you learn. So I brought several articles, you know, several atoms or commercial products where that's why you had several hundred billion pounds of polymers made. And I give you a notion of them. So this is, uh, I'm actually pretty surprised. This cup is made of the more expensive material called PET. It's ductile. And you have seen the brittle one that's polystyrene, but this is the PET. Usually they are all labeled at the, on the bottom. And this bag, obviously, well, I wouldn't say obviously, this bag, the way they make noise, makes me feel it's not polyethylene. Okay, I'm being artful here. Why? Because polyethylene has a Tg of a minus 100. Uh, this is a concept that you will learn, but basically it's basically it's a, a temperature at which it become hard. Uh, this noise makes you think that this Tg is not that low. So, but I'm surprised, there is an option that this could be some treated polystyrene but I don't think it's polystyrene. It's, it's possibly it's polypropylene. And this is definitely polypropylene because it's labeled so. I give you this container of polypropylene to show you it cracked. And the reason it cracked is I put it in the freezer, which is below TG. Ah, uh, minus five, and you know, minus five-ish. So, freezer, if you know, typically is minus 20 or, or lower a little. So it's become glossy. So this polypropylene famously is known to become brittle when it turns glossy. And uh, of course, uh, I, I will not uh, uh, skip uh, the, 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 this fork. Uh, I don't want to cause any. Damage. So, it's entirely brittle. And then we have to make the fork uh, thick enough, bulky enough, so that before it breaks, it, I can get my food in my mouth. Okay? So, why they do that? More importantly, today, you, you, you should all be on that wagon or at least thinking about the fact that we are being accused of being the polluters, you know, plastic pollution, all over the world, you know, in the ocean, everywhere. And the key is to find biodegradable and uh, 
uh, and possibly also biomass based if we don't want to run out of uh, supply from petroleum. Oh, so the biodegradable, which will avoid this uh, landfill, has essentially one challenge, the mechanics. Uh, is this mother nature, whoever, one in it's our invention to make this and this. And they are just damn good. They're mechanical property is just good enough. And we use them and they are cheap. To replace them with equal mechanical properties has been next to impossible. I say this uh, in the sense uh, chemist. I, our job becomes secondary because we have to molecularly make a degradable polymer that's equally strong. But once you have that biodegradable polymer, the ones we have in the market called PLA, polylactic acid, it's brittle, like polystyrene. And unlike, so I, I give you this information, uh, and this notes is re, is being recorded here. I give you this, uh, all this information uh, uh, that you will find it useful as we move on in discussions. Uh, polystyrene has a, a TG of 100. So um, it's hard for you to have a polystyrene holding boiling water because <laughs> this collapse, the, the, the cup will collapse because it becomes soft at 100. So we only hold it for uh, cold beverages. PET has a TG of 70 degrees. It also cannot hold boiling water. Cannot, right? Um, PLA? Again, no good in that sense. And then it's brittle. So it's, it's worse than polystyrene because it can tolerate less heat and it's brittle. It's capable of crystallizing. Once it crystallizes, uh, it holds its uh, solidity through crystallization. Then it can withstand 100 degrees. Uh, just like this polypropylene at room temperature holds up very nicely, although Tg is minus 5 because of crystallization which serve the role of cross-linking. So we'll, we'll go on to, to describe all this in, in, in sufficient detail. Um, so the promising biodegradable PLA, uh, we have made it cheap enough commercially. It just does not have good enough mechanical problems. So this job falls on our shoulder in terms of uh, uh, how can we overcome, how can we achieve better mechanical property, which goes back to why the properties of polystyrene, sorry, the, uh, the properties of polypropylene and polyethylene are so good. And furthermore, we need to study the cases why some polymers are, are not so good. Or for example, this polypropylene is not so good when it's being frozen in the freezer at the mi at minus 20. Okay, so I think this is uh, kind of the motivation I have for you, that uh, at the end of the day, wh when we're done, uh, hopefully we start to have a feel, a, a sense, even as a chemist, about what we should be shooting for uh, in terms of uh, achieving adequate mechanical properties. And speaking of that, here comes the most uh, crucial part, which I'm expecting you to answer for me after physics one. What do you think is the most important and perhaps unique single parameter or characterization of your polymers 
แต่อยู่คะแนนอยากให้คุยกันสิ What what properties of polymers is uniquely important? Okay, wonderful. So, unlike ceramic, unlike uh, 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 let's say metal, their building block unit is atomistic. There's no molecular weight per se that we can vary. And polymers is unique. In our because we have the ability to build that polymer of length that hopefully you can control. To cut the story short, crucially, that very important parameter of molecular weight is even more important when you speak about mechanics. It turns out, all of what I have said, none of this will in, be in existence if their molecular weight is not long, high enough. So you will learn that my chain. I'm not afraid to say my chain, right? Because of physics one, you have all of it. My chains must be long enough. For us to make them usable at all. If you don't, if you cut this molecular weight of poly, the PET basically, to uh, let's say 5,000 molecular weight, it, this thing will just collapse. Meaning, uh, if I touch it, it will fall into powder. It's that bad. It's 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 useless. So there's a challenge of having high enough molecular weight, and we are, what we are about to learn is when I have high molecular weight, I have the opposite challenge. When the molecular weight is very high, it turns out it becomes challenging to process it, and this largely is a more than half of what we are going to. Eventually, learn to appreciate why molecular weight is high. Uh, it, it is uh, not only more energy intensive to process, but sometimes simply intrinsically difficult to process. Uh, I make example of polyethylene. Another challenge in terms of processing. I know this is a word yet to be fully explained. Another one. Besides polyethylene, is all these uh, rubbery polymers. So we are talking about polybutadiene, polyisoprene, SBR. That's isoprene, uh, styrene isoprene copolymers, and they are just uh, uh, difficult to process because the uh, because the chains are rather long, and we cannot afford for that chain to be too short, even though you have cross-linking that you subsequently introduce. So hopefully we will touch on that as well. But I have enough motivation here for you to really pay attention to this class. And uh, uh, again, I emphasize it, it, it's known to be difficult only and become more so than before, as I learned from students in the past class complaining about it, is more of our teaching has uh, uh, adopted the mode of PPT. All the information is laid out on each slide, as if uh, you can just memorize those results instead of learning how to uh, have those results on your own. Learning it so that next time you can have your new result by the same habit and by similar methods. So my goal was to ho hopefully uh, uh, give you a, a cross section of how uh, the polymer science can be uh, learned or done in, in, a, in a way that um, 
that allows you to have more independence intellectual. So the challenge is in whatever I say, uh, you, you don't automatically agree, but rather uh, insist that I show you why they are the way they are without violating the first principle, so-called, without violating the scientific principles that you are familiar with. So uh, probably this is uh, one of the last samples that we can show you. Uh, it's uh, things that we talked about rubber. It's two rubber balls. One bounces, the other does not. So people made this rubber balls, tuned their parameters to exactly achieve what I just showed you. And why is that? That's something that will be a focus of this class. Any questions so far? Well, I'm just a bunch of words so far. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, I, I assure you, uh, the mathematics uh, uh, is, of course, is a la scientific language. When you have simple mathematics, it speaks for exactly the words. Uh, like this means equal, <laughs> really. Uh, so, but our math will be uh, will be kept at a really elementary level. I mean, uh, hardly ever we use calculus, and when we do, with a tiny bit of it, we will uh, remind you where it comes from. Okay. With all that, I think we can proceed. Uh, unless you give me some questions, I'm more than happy to address it uh, right now in some generic way, right? Um, anytime, just feel free to raise your questions, and, uh, as well as uh, for people outside, okay? So, um, so the, can I see, uh, can I see your face, Zhi Yu, Zhi Yu? Yes, thank you. Uh, so, let's talk about the structure of this 10 weeks. A good part of it, which I will indicate how, uh, is in this book that I recently published. Uh, the first few chapters are elementary. Turns out it is the, going to be the content of about half of what we are going to go through. And the rest, meaning the first few chapters being introductory to the subject for the core aspect of this book, which has everything to do with processing, has everything to do with what I will say a little bit about as well. So we will uh, uh, follow this book quite closely uh, for the for the content that we need. Um, so I decided to speak about one more time. Now, now I get away from, you know, I, I'm done with all the motivations I need. Uh, I'm just going to further illustrate or orient you about what we are going to talk about sit in a bigger picture once again. Bigger picture, but now a little bit closer to what we are going to be dealing with. So I decide, I divided the way to think about what we are going to do in two ways. You may recognize on the left, I say disorder state and crystalline state, which is other state. On the left, I say viscoelasticity and mechanical behavior. So, what, if I give a broad title on the left, what I call that? The left. Well, you probably heard about something called structure property relationship. So on the left is what? Huh? If I give you two words, structure and properties, 
So I, I would tend to think that this is about structure or, if you like, the state of the matter. Oops, what did I do? State of the matter. Or, in fact, you have a word that you already learned because you did learn, maybe even related to morphology, right? Whatever. What I'm trying to indicate is that there is this disorder state, which I should break it into two. Uh, all polymers, including your crystalline polymer, polypropylene is crystalline. This uh, cover is also polypropylene. Most likely, well, it is. It's labeled again. So, why I, process, why I make this? It cannot be made when it's crystalline. You follow me? Because the crystalline is a solid state. So you have to melt that crystal. Oh, for polypropylene, the melt don't count the. Uh, it's probably around one sixty or so. Don't quote me, because I don't have to be exactly correct. I, I only need to be aware there is a point where it melts. So to process it, obviously, you need to process at a temperature higher than, higher than, since I don't want to be quoted, higher than that melting temperature. In that melt state, we typically call the melt state, it's, of course, disordered. So all we are talking about, if I don't want to invade into the space here, all we are talking about is that this is a state where it temperature is higher than melting temperature or the glass transition temperature, so that it is a melt or it is a liquid. Well, there is another disorder state. that I may call it glassy. And that's just the ones that's incapable of crystallizing, but we are able to use it very well in terms of having enough rigidity because this material can be sufficiently rigid in absence of crystallization. Oh. A fancy word is called as a supercooled liquid. Liquid reminds you that it's disordered. Uh, it is a liquid in that sense, except it's so cold that the molecules is unable to move very much. So we'll get to that point at some point. The nature of glass is state. We'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, so that's sad, and this one is obvious. Uh, typically, our polymer is only semi-crystalline. So basically, we're talking about a, a semi-crystalline state, which is this, which is this, which is this plastic bag. So that's one. So it's really talking about the state of the material. Right? You confront them either as a melt or as a solid because of glass transition or because of crystallinity, crystallization. Now you know what all you have to deal with. You deal with melt or you deal with polymer in glassy state simply because it's not capable of crystallizing or you deal with it when it's semi-crystalline but when it's semi-crystalline, you have two things to deal with. You deal with as you do here. What is that? <laughs> that it is, that uh, it, it by its nature, for example, PP at room temperature, it likes to be non-glassy. 
I know this is a, probably a concept. So imagine I could somehow prohibit crystallization of my polypropylene. Okay? At room temperature. And then this will not hold its shape. It will be more like this that I uh, intend to uh, demonstrate today. This is PDMS, polydimethyl salox, PDMS, diluxyl siloxane. It's TG. It's used in some elastomers. Is again an order of minus 100. So obviously, it cannot allow you to make a container out of it. It's totally a piece of melt. So if I can suppress crystallization, my PP might look like this. Okay, and the fact it's a solid egg is because you have cross, uh, you have a crystallization. So since we are talking about, I, I want to get you mindset right away. Since we're talking about the state of the matter, I may as well, in a hurry, try to help you visualize what crystallization does to you in terms of giving you solidity. Well, what it does is, if for you, it's actually handy because you, from physical uh, polymer physics one, you already learned about crosslink of a rubber. So this PDMS is uncrosslink, so I'm able to change its shape arbitrarily. But if you crosslink your PDMS, then of course I lose my ability to arbitrarily change its shape because I have to break the chemical bond. So in your mental picture, your polymer, when it's very long, always form a network in your Previous story, you have cross-linking, chemical cross-linking. That's why uh, this uh, material is no longer flowable. Okay? That's your cross-linked rubber. And I'm just trying to uh, make a connection for you. The crystallization does something very similar to what uh, cross-linking does. It fixes all the chains in through their crystalline phase so that no chains can freely move without a great deal of force, meaning unless you force it to, to, be, uh, to come off. And that's that crystalline. I'm not done, right? I'm only saying this polypropylene achieved solidity because of crystallization introduced cross-linking like effect so that my chains are not able to uh, slide past each other freely. This does, this PDMS does, because it's not cross -linking. And you quickly realize there's another state to deal with here. We are talking about the state of the matter, which is what I showed you when I put this in the freezer. When the semi crystalline polymer is brought to a cold enough temperature where it, by nature, likes to stay in a glassy state where a uh, the chains are, are, are unable to, to move around, and it no longer feels soft, it no longer feels rubbery. So, if you like, we're dealing with, I just want to help you organize your mind. We're dealing with four states. This melt state, this glassy state, this rubbery, I just verbalize, right? Save some time. This rubbery uh, crystalline state, this glassy crystalline state. There are four. That's it. So, on the right, 
if I say this is a related is about structure, speaking of of uh, no challenge to uh, to 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 with withstand certain force or stress, then this side is about property, and for our class, it's all about mechanical property. And and one can uh, think about this mechanical properties in several ways, uh, or you are free to think about two, two, two ways. One is you can just think about some basic elasticity question that we will go through. This builds you the, the foundation to understand the mechanical behavior. Okay, so that's what we're going to go through. But speaking of mechanical properties uh, in the sense of in the sense that the force that is required, for example, for me to stretch this, uh, remind you that I'm speaking about mechanics. Uh, another language one could use is, and this is part of this discussion, in other words, after introducing risk elasticity, we can speak a little bit more about a word called rheology, column rheology. It has everything to do with how we can understand processing, how we can make our properly polypropylene into this shape and make this cup, for example. And uh, we will uh, we will have some discussion about this topic of male rheology. In term, in fact, uh, uh, the, the largely this book is about this uh, subject. So, it's supposed to provide some guidance about how to better process. Now. Obviously, if you like, this deals with that melt state, right? All polymers, are, uh, the only thing I'm uh, not uh, going to uh, uh, derail and, and start, uh, say very much is thermal set. The polymer is made of uh, three classes, typically, plastic, Rubber, thermoset. So we are going to talk about the first two. Thermoset typically means you have monomer level things and you start to cook and crystallize and they crosslink and you get the thing. Uh, the processing is rather different. But for the first two, you are always dealing with pre-made polymer. That's a good word to use, right? Basically, your polymer is already made to be molecular weight issue. It's already made to be long. So that's for plastics and rubber. You don't you don't make your polymerization uh, 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 during processing. Well, of course, uh, you could have some reactive processing. That that is a special topic that we will not say very much. Okay, so that's that. How about this polymer in glassy state? I have a word for it, or polymer glassy state, or, in fact, all the states. So we're going to talk about all that state. What, what's in common? They are solid, solid polymers. And a word I would like to use 
is whether we can learn something molecularly. In other words, at the molecular at the chain level, how to think about its mechanics. So I will call that molecular mechanics. This is a term I deliberately use uh, because uh, supposedly to help our friend doing chemistry synthesis, the only way to help is to share your understanding at the chain level, molecular level, so that you can tell your friend, hey, this is what must happen. For example, high enough molecular weight. Your, your, your colleague will ask you, gee, why you need high molecular weight? You will be able to say why. OK? OK, so it's elementary in that sense. You will be able to say why, and in fact, exactly at least how high your molecular weight needs to be. Okay, so this is a crucial. And lastly, also dealing with solid state. From two to four, they are all solid state. And you can see we listed the three because they are three different objects. They are three different things. So for each of the three, you may have to think about this topic separately and then try to unify about how to think about it. But lastly, we, this is something we very more recently start to look at. I thought uh, it should become eventually part of the whole picture of half of this pie, which is what? Which is to, uh, you see, in this molecular mechanics, we already have to address the issue of this is brittle. And this is ductile. We already have to understand why they are ductile versus why they are brittle. But there is another aspect, which is this. How each of your two to four states respond when you already have something created. You already have something that's already breaking. How resistant you are to that. Right? Which is terribly important in your application. How, yeah, you have already breaking, but can it survive the breaking? Or this thing just going to propagate the crack will propagate and fall apart. So I call that part nothing new for 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 the, the, the concept. It is known as fracture mechanics. It deals with how your sample can resist failure in presence of a cut, in presence of flaws in presence of voids, for example. But sometimes your processing cannot avoid air bubbles. So with this, I think we are really uh, pretty clear about our task. It's a daunting task. It is involved the uh, uh, the elementary, you know, it is supposedly elementary. It's supposed to uh, uh, tell us how, why we can use certain polymer for what purpose. Okay. Any questions? So, uh, depending on the time, I will. Uh, possibly a touch on this uh, uh, near the end, uh, maybe last lecture. Uh, simply because we start to do something and find out uh, uh, perhaps uh, there's a lot of uh, things to, to be done there. To, to, uh, uh, the ultimate goal is the same. That is, how can we make stronger problems? 
uh, is not only strong in the sense of uh, overcoming brittle fracture, but also how we can make it so that it's uh, less uh, prone to failure when you have a pre-existing crack already. So it's so it, that really allows us to complete this whole uh, task. In fact, to the point that last year I wouldn't be able to talk about this. This is as old as uh, since the fall semester, a few months. But we already have a, a, a great deal of insight about why this is useful and how we can talk about it. The connection between these two topics is pretty strong. We'll see how far we can go. Um, the largely, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll especially initially focus on the so-called viscoelasticity and malreology, which is part of uh, speaking about mechanical behavior. So to start, I'm going to speak about viscoelasticity. This, uh, I would hope to think that, I would hope that you feel that this is a rather, rather abstract concept, basically. If that's the case, wonderful, because I want to make sure that uh, pretty soon you will no longer feel this is abstract. And you will find that this is foundational for everything we are about to say about the mechanical aspects of polymer. Okay, as if I haven't finished it. This is just uh, one other way to describe the uh, content or, or the bigger picture of this. You have polymer in liquid state, we deal with the rheology. You have polymers in glassy state or semi-crystalline state, we're dealing with uh, molecular mechanics. And then for solid polymers, you may also have to deal with uh, how they resist crack, which is fracture mechanics. Uh, so we have pretty solid understanding on this rheology, and uh, due to this book, we have pretty firm ground, uh, phenomenologically, to say the least, about what to expect uh, and what to predict. And uh, uh, on these two topics, molecular mechanics, there there is still a great deal of work to be done, but. Uh, uh, but it's ongoing, and it's uh, um, I would say it's uh, it's uh, pretty heavy activities at Akron. Let's say relatively speaking, and. Uh, so you may think of them as as the episodes one, two, two prime, and three, and the sequence has to be this way. You do this, and this, and this, and this sequentially. Cannot be the other way around. The other way around of doing it has not been very fruitful. If you demand to think about at the molecular level. Well, at least that's my uh, assertion. Okay, let's get started. Unless you have a question, I'm happy to. Any questions? Offline, online? All right. The beautiful thing about having it in the morning is you guys have no chance of falling asleep. I'm half joking because, because we have had a, a late afternoon. Uh, I'm half joking also in the sense I'm, I, I'm certainly hoping to have uh, uh, caught your attention. So. So you can think about this uh, however you want. Um, 
perhaps uh, you can call what we have three parts. We, we, we are most likely going to focus on the first two parts. So, uh, so the first part, you may say, it is real logical, per se. In other words, to speak about something real, uh, on rheology is to speak about the basics of physical elasticity and so on and so forth. So part two is dealing with the, the mechanics in solid state. And of course, uh, in there, you have a polymer that's glassy, so we need to deal with it. the nature of the glass transition. And then for semi-crystalline polymers, uh, you have crystallinity to deal with, which we will uh, have a more detailed discussion in the, in the last few lectures of this course. So, and then of course, as I said, there's part three, fracture mechanics, which depend on the time we, we may just briefly touch on. So, uh, so that's the organization, three parts. We may only do two parts. And uh, uh, the rest is I'm going to remind you when we switch from one to part one to part two. So we'll start with part one. And uh, we'll, as I said, why not try to follow this book? What I have not indicated is through our, uh, if you are in the university system, I think you should be able to access uh, this uh, book uh, to get a free uh, e-copy of it. Let me know otherwise, uh, but uh, that's a pretty safe assumption. So in that sense, uh, I don't know what you have it, uh, but basically uh, you will have access to the book. Uh, but for you, I, I simply uh, suggest you just uh, try to follow the blackboard, yeah, so whatever I'm going to. That, uh, the, the dynamics of it. Uh, and I will try, since we have the book, I will try to, to follow uh, the topics uh, closely, including the subtitles of it. So, uh, as I said, uh, or I, as I used to say, uh, As I used to say, let's pretend we're just cavemen, just coming out of the cave. Okay? Coming out of the cave, want to do something in your life. And uh, uh, you're a scientist. Uh, it's interesting. When, once we have a degree, bachelor degree, we call ourselves scientists already. I'm half teasing you, right? <laughs> Whether we know how to do science yet, uh, that's what you are here for, in graduate school. And, and it is in that spirit, one hope the teaching is already part of demonstrating how to do science. And that, uh, so, so please, in your mindset, you should have a switch from the college mindset. Which means, don't take answer for granted, and, uh, and learn, start to learn to ask questions so that you can eventually gain intellectual independence. So speaking of science, let me just borrow this space here. There is always three parts to it, three layers. Uh, there's, you are coming out of the cave, caveman. You're coming out of a cave wanting to do something. The first thing you want to do is to address what? What to do coming out of the cave. So if you don't like that, that means you are going to proceed in some empirical way. Right? Empirical way. And after that, pretty soon you will see all that. You want to see not only what happens, but how it happens. So I call that phenomenological.
And the Holy Grail is G. Why it happened that way? And that's theoretical. For any subject you encounter, suppose there are these three layers. So you can, you, you, you can never avoid first asking what. It's like you can never run without knowing how to walk. And so the first thing, this topic, is exactly talking about what. What do you do coming out of nowhere, knowing nothing? Well, luckily, you are not coming out of nowhere, not, not having nothing, because you already have a lot of basic background. And I'm just here to uh, lead you uh, in thinking about these three layers of inquiry. The three levels of inquiry, if you like, right? And so uh, you can uh, trust me for the following information to offer: that if you want to do processing rheology, it turns out, you know, I have my here we are. I have my uh, polymer here. It turns out, for example, let's say you want to make fibers. Well, it turns out the first thing is uh, fibers made of poly, uh, poly PET. For example. It is, it's actually you're going to take a filament that's, of course, in the melt state, and then you're going to try to, turns out, extrude it, meaning a large volume of material going through a little hole coming out, and then you try to stretch it uh, a great deal. What does that do? It's a matter of shape changing. That's all. So it turns out the processing is all about asking about what happens when you're processing rheology, the first part. So this first part is all going to be about the melt state. Right? Only the second part is that and that. So let's focus on the first part. They are all in this PDMS example. The reason I give you is because that's what we're doing. And it's just matter of shape change. And essentially, so that's why that's there. And essentially, there are two ways to have shape change. There are, of course, more than two ways, but these are the most uh, basic and easier to describe ways of shape change. And that is what I'm going to start with. This shape changing, uh, th there could be different manners when we do this. And this first word speaks about the manner in which we do it. We call it startup. And I'm going to first focus on simple shear. In fact, we will uh, deal with, uh, concentrate on this mode first until it's necessary to talk about extension. This is extension. Well, I try to stretch. Now, uh, what do we mean by startup and what do we mean by shear? And what do we mean that this achieves nothing else but shape change? Right? So indeed, we're talking about what to do. When you get a piece of sample, what do you do? Eat the way. I try to draw it in three dimensions. Well, it turns out the way you do is you visualize your sample is sandwiched between two plates, separated by a height of H. Right? So yeah, of course, the rest of you know how to visualize it. I, I don't have to do a great deal of that. And that's a sample you have. And now I'm going to draw two-dimensional. 
So I'm going to just, in fact, I'll be rigorous by saying I will establish a coordinate, partition coordinate of x, y. Z is pointing out from the, out of the screen toward me. So this is just x, y now. So you got this piece of sample that initially looked like this. How about I make it to look like that by moving the upper surface from the original position here to what I indicated. So it's tilted. I, I hate to use that word because it's not tilted. It rigorously called simple shear. So what the upper surface that you hope your sample will go with is being moved to the right horizontally. Okay? And a matter of simplicity, a beautiful simplicity, which the textbook never talks about why, usually the textbook never talks about why, is that not only you know your upper surface is moving x to the right, but you also know at half height, it moved half x, and so on and so forth. A third of h, it moved a third of x. As my red line shows, it's linearly changing with how far with the distance from the bottom plate that you fix. So, this is all the watt part. So, what's the degree of shape change? Well, this should depict what the degree of shape change there is. It's dimensionless. You will hear from this class, dimensionless is the way to speak about science. Because um, it's never good enough to say, Tom, wrong very fast. It's really meaningless. I'm an old man, of course you run faster than me. But compared to Olympic record, you're probably quite slow. So you need to normalize. In fact, everything can be normalized by the current world record. When you talk about running, swimming, bicycling, anything. Then you can talk. And you'll be disappointed to know, oh, typical common man without training is a factor of two, if not three times as slow as the, Olymp as the world record. Well, two is about reasonable. At least for, uh, it's only because we all know wrong, how to run, so two, is, you know, but it's come to swimming. Two may be a very optimistic, <laughs> okay? So, dimension. Your world record is your dimension. It is the variable that you need to compare with. Here, that world record is H. In any case, I, I don't think I confused you. We call this strength. A way to describe the shape change, how much shape change there is. And if you bother, it's called shear strength, because we're talking about shear. And by writing this, you assume uniform here. That's crucial. Because if that's not true, I don't know how to describe it. You see my point? It better be true. Because if it's not true, then as someone coming out of the cave, I don't know how to describe what to do because uh, let me remind you what I mean by all that. You've got your sample, you want to change its shape, you move your upper plate, and you pray to God that at half height, your sample that you have no access to, see, at the half height, 
that dash line, you have no access. You have no control. You don't, you don't tell how half height should move. So you pray to God that it will move half. Because if it doesn't, then I'm in trouble. Then what, how, what I'm dealing with? Okay? So it's out of convenience and necessity we assume this is the case. And I will eventually tell you under this subject one that is no longer the case. For polymer, almost uh, uniquely, as a liquid, in other words, not as a solid. As a solid, I, I, I know I have a habit of interjecting some comments from time to time. Not necessarily uh, non-self-contained. They are all logically contained. I invite you to think about when this is in the solid state. Just switch gears for a moment. Remember, this deformation applies for both. Would not care whether this sample is liquid or solid. It wouldn't. As long as you develop a means to hold the top and the bottom of your sample. Let's imagine we can. Then if it's a solid, oh my goodness, uh, common sense come to help. The way we grew up, you know, we have been experiencing for 20, 30 years. We know solid typically do not deform indefinitely without breaking. Yeah? I mean, even our rubber band, whatever, there is a limit without breaking. Which, of course, means this relationship at some point will not be true. Right? Because it will break. So that's just the extreme I'm mentioning to you. Okay, now let's get back to the shape chain with symbol shear. Um, good enough. So the, the rest of uh, uh, what needs to be said is that sometimes uh, we don't uh, uh, not, uh, we not only we not only just display uh, uh, a certain amount, but we display it with certain being a being in a liquid state, we can deform it in the sense that. that we deform it indefinitely, or if you wish. In other words, I'm going to move my upper plate with certain speed. OK? What does startup mean? Startup means, I just borrow the space that's available. Startup means that all of a sudden, I t equals 0 my velocity start to be built instantly. Sorry. So that's what start up means. There is a sharp, sudden start of my deformation. How sudden? We are going to assume it's infinitely fast. In reality, of course, it takes finite time. So if that's the case, I will say my shape changing continuously. In fact, I will see that my shape change, which is given by gamma, is really V H times T. So it's going to change continuously as time goes by, linearly with t. And v over h is known as shear rate.
if you like, velocity is to move little time, little time of x, it will move delta x amount over time delta t. Then this is can be rewritten as delta x over h divided by delta t. And this is just a little change of the shape. And that's why when you take this to the limit of uh, very small times, it is a so-called derivative. This is really nothing but d gamma dt. Only for those of you who are still, I'm doing two things. One is trying to remind you the elements of calculus. Uh, otherwise, just treat this as, as uh, uh, reminding you that uh, that was how a uh, derivative of a material, uh, of a quantity is defined. Uh, uh, such that this is true. So, um, that's fine. Uh, it, it, uh, we're just managing to say how fast we're changing the shape. Let me just give you a sense that I started in my book right away, and that's important for rheology. That is to ask ourselves how long it takes, how long, how long does it take for us, for this X to move a distance as much as the height? Okay, so if you flip that story of x over h, we're really asking, remember, this is a function of t, we're really asking at what t1, we have this equals 1. Well, we know that x is v over t, when x is t is h is when t goes to t1 at which x uh, h is v t1 therefore t1 is h over v and it that turns out to be 1 over gamma dot if we have used this definition so very quickly i reached a point of uh, indicating for you that you as an experimenter have the ability to control what you are doing in two ways. One is, uh, is what you hope you are controlling. The other is you are sure you are controlling. What you are surely controlling is to make sure that the time it takes to move my upper plate a distance equal to h, the time it takes is clearly just divide, given by h over v, depending on, in other words, given by the speed you, you use. It's a particular number. And secondly, the rest you are hoping is that this could still occur homogeneously. So there is one thing that you control, this you control, whether it's homogeneous or not, well, you hope so. That's it. So we call this 100% deformation. In other words, if you move 2h to the right, we call that 200% deformation. That's just the word, that's just definition. So, but this uh, point of 100% uh, deformation is interesting and it will relate to the homework that you make assumption to, that you assume uh, 
some appreciable amount of sh of uh, shape change has occurred. Well, how do you speak about appreciable? 100% is appreciable. I mean, anyone can take a note and see, oh, that's a lot of shape change. Yeah? And that's it. I mean, if it's only 2%, of course, you say, gee, this hardly changes shape. I'm not interested in that. Well, there will be reason later why you're not interested in that. But interested in large deformation or appreciable 100%. Okay, so we are done with how much time it takes to make 100% deformation. Okay? I will not be able to move on very much from this point, except to remind you, paving the road ahead, why we speak about this T1 of 100% deformation, of the time it takes to make 100%. Once again, just like that, speed is meaningless. This T1, without reference, is also meaningless. Okay? For some of us, just personality-wise, I want to get to airport two hours before departure. And some others just want to get there 30 minutes before. It's, <laughs> time is different for different people, for different personalities. So it's the same thing. We need something to normalize. So the T1 is meaningless unless you compare with another time. And that other time has, is the core of at least half of what we're, I'm going to teach you about. The other time is the internal clock of your problem. You may find it's very funny. There is an internal clock. Yes, there is. Why? I can show you that internal clock right now. So this is PDMS. Uh, several hundred thousand uh, molecular weight, several hundred thousand per mole. And uh, this uh, uh, following test will inform me about the internal clock. So when I threw it like this, it bounces. So based on the basic understanding of uh, viscoelasticity, I could uh, immediately indicate that the internal time scale of this uh, sample will be at least as uh, long as uh, possibly a second or a fraction of a second. It will not be a millisecond. It will not be a microsecond. Just based on this experiment. And we'll expand on this, but the basic point I'm talking about is the contact time of this PDMS ball with table is a fraction of a second. And that time, apparently, is sufficiently short compared to the internal clock. So we will speak a lot about the internal clock. I'm just trying to pay, uh, catch your attention about, or, or making sure you pay attention about what will be introduced uh, next. When I say next, maybe in the next few lectures, not, not immediately, this internal time scale. associated with your material. So it's intrinsic to your material. And it could be even called a material pro uh, a property. And we usually even use a, a symbol of tau to represent. So we'll get to that uh, first uh, phenomenologically and subsequently theoretically. Okay. Enough on, on, uh, on a startup here. Any questions? This is a, a, a pretty foundational. We better know all this uh, language and know the, the spirit of, of coming out of the cave, uh, start to think about what can be said and done. And that's what this is being introduced. Yes. Excellent point. Oh no, the fantastic point. Oh. You see, we do several hundred billion pounds of processing. 
or in the uh, uh, melt state. And the, the processing equipment are rather complicated. Depending on how you do it, it could be molding, it could be injection, it could be flow molding. There are a variety. It could be uh, 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 film casting, it could, it could be fiber spinning, all kinds of complicated devices. And to learn what happens in that processing, we reduce our exercise to dealing with such simple case as I'm just showing, the simple shear. So we go to our lab, just like many R&D uh, in industry will have such a lab, where they would want to learn how they behave in the complicated processing by going, taking their sample to a device as simple as simple shear, like what I, I showed you here. And they are going to try to learn everything about it. When I change the shape, how much, uh, how it's going to respond, is it going to be uniform, and uh, how much force I have to exert to make sure this plate can continue at the speed of V, things like that, so that I know my processing has enough power, you know, all those things. Uh, in the lab, it's a wonderful question you had. In the lab, this is about a millimeter. So you tell me, how do I see it's uniform or not? No, seriously. <laughs> no, seriously. If it is, this, this is no longer was a joke. This become the entry to the discovery described in the book. So first thing first, why do you suspect it's not uniform? Right? That's the million dollar question. How should, why on earth you expect this not to be uniform? And perhaps enough of whatever reasoning, experiences, and whatever will tell you whom. And certainly luck, meaning you count on this to be uniform. I said it before, it's out of convenience and it's out of almost out of necessity, meaning if you're given the job to characterize this, you say, I would depend on it. That's the key. I depend on it, so I re I'm even reluctant to challenge the idea that this is not true. <laughs> okay? But it's a millimeter. You can't see it. It's really tiny, millimeter. My goodness, we all know how small it is. So, in fact, I have a follow-up question. If it's not uniform, what does it mean? What's the consequence? And let alone why it does so. Uh, so, no, you are, you, you are, your question is keeping us in suspense. Perfect. <laughs> That's what it is. And as I said, this book is all about finding out whether it's uniform or not. This is just a shear, and then there's other forms to, to, to think about. Oh, this is wonderful. Uh, so, um, so the homework sort of for you is, come on, be, because I, before I review anything is, would you be able to come up with some way of, of uh, determining, verifying whether it's uniform, given the fact it's only a millimeter? And, of course, uh, another sort of like a homework for you is uh, for you to be comfortable with two things. One is to uh, one is to there are really two parts to it. One is to be able to do such an estimate. The other is to be able to appreciate what you're dealing with. Because eventually we'll answer the question of whether it's uniform or not. And how much confidence do we have to say it is or not? So let me give you what I do plan to have, uh, to, to, to indicate this to you in a hurry. So let, let's just make it uh, simple. So this is a, a millimeter. Let, let this, uh, uh, let this uh, lens be a centimeter just for the sake of 
Oh, let me try the, the, the millimeter, right? Oh, my goodness. It's more than I, what I think. Uh, so let's, let's assume this is a, just let's work it out. So let's say this lens is 10 centimeter, and this uh, uh, width is also 10 centimeter. I'm trying to figure out how much weight there is. OK. Uh, so it's 100 times 0.1 centimeter cube, yeah? Yes? Which is about 10 cube, yeah? Which is about 10 gram, yeah? And let's assume this molecular weight in this biopolymer is 100,000, so 10 to the 5 G per mole. Okay. How many molecules are in there? Well, it's 10 grams. If I have 10 to the 5 grams, that, then I would have a mole of material, right? Because that's the definition of molecular weight. If I have 10 to the 5 grams, which is nothing but 100 kilograms, I would have one mole there. I don't have 100 kilograms. I only have 10 grams. So, of course, I only have this many mole. Right? I only have 10 grams, not, uh, not 100 kilograms. This is 100 kilograms per mole. So, this is how many molecules I'm going to have. Right? which is 6 times minus 19. Oh, sorry, plus 19. Yeah? This is a lot of molecules. We talk about trilling, we talk about whatever. I don't, uh, I don't go to the dictionary to figure out what is 18 called, or 19, rather. So this is a lot of molecules. Well, give you another notion of it. I know 100,000 may mean nothing to you. In fact, it means very little to me in the sense if you look at a Gaussian coil, which you had in polymer physics one, it probably has a RG of, let's say, 100 nanometers or even less. I'm making a guess. We will, we will event, I will eventually give you some uh, literature tabulation of, of different polymers, a different molecular weight, what size it will be. So this is not a bad estimate around that. And if you stretch it, probably straighten it, probably could start to reach a, a micron. Even. But still tiny. Well, tiny, but you have so many. And each of them, if you're magnifying it, it's quite uh, large in the sense it allows other chains to insert into you cells. Okay, so I start to speak about polymer physics now. This is polymer physics. This is not. This is for any material, right? This is just definitions. Black box, you can treat this as a black box. This is not polymer physics. This is any one can speak about, assuming any material you have. There. But this is polymer physics for the first time. And you have no trouble with it because you know the chains are Gaussian like, and, and I just draw a bunch of it. I don't have enough time to draw enough for you because when do I reach a point of stop drawing? Well, it has to be space filling. What do I mean by that? What I mean is each coil is open, meaning is it, it uh, is uh, uh, not uh, space filling. <laughs> each coil, uh, 
each coil is like what I draw for you. And uh, uh, to be space filling, why space space filling? I mean, the density goes to that of water, plus minus. I mean, remember, polymers you have melt state, solid state, crystalline, glassy. Essentially, it doesn't go anywhere between 0.7 to 1.2, perhaps. And probably it's very generous already. For our class, this will all be treated as being one, because it doesn't change at order magnitude. So all of our future estimate is going to assume density is that of water. Not, not very far from it. So you, you, in the space of one chain, and this is all paved for much more sophisticated discussion uh, 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 that will occur in the future. Uh, but I want this to plan in your mind right away. Uh, I don't want to delay discussion of polymer physics. Uh, you know, I want to introduce as early as possible. So this is the one. You have a chain and the rest of chain uh, and occupy a space which you can call it a pervaded, pervaded volume. And uh, it's very open, so the other chain has to come into that pervaded volume until there is no space left. By that time, the density is about one. Just because it's made of carbon and hydrogen in such a way that eventually you know, oxygen and, and hydrogen has similar molecular weight. So eventually, it's, it's not very far from one. Um, uh, I think today we'll stop here in the sense uh, we are, uh, I'm grasp the opportunity of asking why it's uniform or not by, by uh, in a hurry telling you they are it's not so obvious that they are uniform or not. Uh, you have very hard to deal with issue. You have 10 to 19 or 10 to 20 molecules. All the molecules insert into each other this way, each maintaining a Gaussian-like shape on the, on the statistical average. And such a sub object is being sheared, is being grabbed on to from the two ends and being displaced away from each other from both sides. And they are, they are at least a million layers. Well, you know exactly. Um, if, uh, if, uh, uh, not, not a million, but a uh, hundred thousand. But basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a millimeter. It's 10 to the million nanometer, right? So it's, uh, it's not a million. It's 10,000. Layers. It's still a lot, 10,000. And what, did, what happens? Well, I'm, my ability is only grabbing the layer next to the surface. The reason I grab it is because it absorbs onto my surface, both sides. So it's that absorption through which I grab it, and then I start to move them apart over a gap of a millimeter over 10 to the 4, 10,000 layers. And depending on how fast I'm doing it, is the whole point, T1. How fast I'm doing it? Of course, you have no answer because I haven't told you the internal clock. What is the internal clock? It, internal clock is about how fast the red chain moves relative to the other chains. Uh, loosely speaking. That says about how fast. So what if, uh, you know, I, I'm always anxious to get that point. What if this T1 is so short that by making a 100% deformation, which is what T1 takes, that the white red chain has not 
moved appreciably away from other chains at all yet. What does that mean? That means I can make 200% difference. I can make 10,000% difference. Meaning I can move many H's to the right and left, you know, in the shear, and the molecules have not had a chance to move. Can you imagine what happens then? That's the, that's the thing that you want to contemplate. Okay, with that I, I close. I think uh, in the future, uh, let, let me just stop the recording then we can talk. Uh, in the future, let's see where we are. All right.